Hey guys, how's it going? TJ here with Dead History, and I'm here today with Henry. Hello. Welcome back, Henry. How you doing? I'm good. Good, good. And today is our next Vice Presidential Series installment, and we're going to be taking a look at what number Vice President, Henry? The 15th Vice President of the United States, Hannibal Hamlin. <laughs> Great job, dude. Yeah. The 15th Vice President of the United States, the guy behind us, Hannibal Hamlin. Yeah, no, no, not not Hannibal like Hannibal Lecter. No, not that one. Not Silence of the Lambs, right? This isn't Clarice, you know? I mean, what are we thinking here? No, Hannibal Hamlin. Probably the coolest name of any vice president ever, by the way. We got some real cool things to tell you about Hannibal Hamlin. But first, before we get into all that, Henry, tell the people what they have to do. Hit subscribe down below, leave all your comments, questions. Um, drop a bell and give us thumbs up. <laughs> yeah, like you, it. you got it, you got it. Hit subscribe down below. Give us a like and a thumbs up, right? Leave all those comments and questions. We love the comments and questions. And yup, hit that little notification bell so you can be notified every time we do a new video. And when is that, Henry? Every week. Every single week, that's right. So now sit back and relax, because here we go. Our next Vice Presidential Series installment, the 15th Vice President of the United States, Hannibal Hamlin, and this is... Dead History. Dead History. Hey guys, TJ back with you, and I'm here with Henry, of course. Hi. And today, yup, the guy behind us, our next Vice Presidential Series installment, the 15th Vice President of the United States. What's his name, Henry? Hannibal Hamlin. Hannibal Hamlin. Abraham Lincoln's first Vice President. Yeah, we're going to get into a lot of really cool things about Hannibal Hamlin, yes. such as, like I just said, he was Abraham Lincoln's Vice President. Vice President. Yeah, in the first term. So could you imagine if he would have stayed on for the second term, he would have became President President Hannibal Hamlin. That's right, when Lincoln got assassinated. We're going to get into all that. Plus, Hannibal Hamlin was definitely anti-slavery. He was not for slavery. He was all about getting rid of slavery and abolishing slavery. We're going to get into all that stuff. He was also from Maine. Really cool. The only guy all the way up there from Maine. Some pretty cool stuff. And lastly, another cool fact about Hannibal Hamlin. He also fought in the Civil War in a, I believe it was a militia up in Maine. Some militia that formed in Maine. He fought in the Civil War. So not only was he vice president... Yeah. He, he was a Civil War vet. Yes. Pretty crazy, right? Mm -hmm. Cool stuff. So, all right. They did the likes. They did the they subscribes. Subscribe. They did all the comments and questions. Now, Henry, what do they got to go get? Go get the popcorn and the pretzels and the potato chips and soda. But wait. No. Because when we're going to be releasing this video, it's going to be... be Thanksgiving. It's going to be Thanksgiving. So, first and foremost, Happy, Happy Thanksgiving, Thanksgiving, everyone. And so, really, what they got to go get is the... Turkey and the cranberry sauce and the stuffing and the mashed potatoes and the football and the Thanksgiving Day Parade and all that stuff, right? Yep. And then, of course, afterwards, they got to get the pumpkin pie and the, what else? What other kind of pie? Uh, pumpkin. Uh, you said apple. Pumpkin, apple pie? That's right. There you go. Good. Go get all that stuff. Because here we go. Our next Vice Presidential Series installment, the man behind us, Hannibal Hamlin, the 15th Vice President of the United States. Sit back, relax, and enjoy. And enjoy. Hey guys, welcome. Welcome to Dead History, and welcome to our next Vice Presidential Series installment as we're taking a look at the 15th Vice President of the United States, Hannibal Hamlin. This is TJ, of course, with Dead History. Welcome, everyone. And a very happy Thanksgiving to everyone. Uh, I know our opening, uh, you saw Henry and I wishing everyone a happy Thanksgiving and saying that you would be watching this on Thanksgiving Day. Uh, we recorded that before we realized we were going to take the week off. Uh, we thought it would just be a lot better to take a week off uh, rather than release a video on Thanksgiving Day. Uh, everybody's very busy on Thanksgiving, of course, so, uh, you know, we actually want people to watch our videos, uh, so we just figured it would be much better to wait, uh, until this week. 
So here we go. Uh, our next vice presidential series installment, uh, looking at the 15th vice president, Hannibal Hamlin. And Hamlin is one of my favorites uh, for a few reasons. Uh, but one of my quirky reasons, so to speak, is because of his name. Um, just the fact that this man almost, you know, could have became our president after Lincoln was assassinated and we would have had a, a president Hannibal Hamlin. Uh, just love the name. I think it's awesome. So here we go. Going to jump right in here, taking a look at our 15th vice president of the United States, Hannibal Hamlin. The emotional issue of slavery demolished the American political system during the 1850s. The Whig Party disintegrated, the Democrats divided, and the Free Soil and American or Know Nothing parties flourished briefly and died. Emerging from the wreckage of the old system, the Republican Party, which ran its first presidential campaign in 1856, drew converts from all of these parties. Within the new party stood men who had spent years fighting each other under different political banners. In constructing a presidential ticket in 1860, therefore, Republicans needed candidates who would reflect their complex construction and reinforce their new unity. They picked a presidential candidate, Abraham Lincoln, who was not only a Westerner, but a Whig who claimed Henry Clay as his political role model. To balance Lincoln, Republicans chose as their vice presidential candidate, Hannibal Hamlin, an Easterner who had spent the bulk of his political career as a Democrat and who had battled Henry Clay when they served together in the United States Senate. Despite their differences, Lincoln and Hamlin shared an opposition to the expansion of slavery into the Western territories without being abolitionists. Now a bit about Hannibal Hamlin's youth. Hannibal Hamlin owed his classical name to his grandfather, Eliezer Hamlin. Or Eliezer, I believe it is. Eliezer Hamlin, a man well-read in history who named his first son after the Roman general Scipio Africanus. Everyone called the boy Africa. And he called his twin son Cyrus after the great Persian conqueror and Hannibal after the Carthaginian general who crossed the Alps on elephants in his campaigns against Rome. Cyrus became a Harvard-trained medical doctor and moved to the village of Paris Hill, Maine, where on August 27th of 1809 was born his son, whom he named after his brother Hannibal. The boy grew up in a prosperous family, living in an imposing three-story white house, a natural leader among his peers, physically fit and athletic, Hannibal was also an avid reader. He was sent to local public schools and then to, to Hebron Academy. Hannibal's ambition to become a lawyer was nearly sidetracked. First, when his elder brother took ill, forcing him to leave school to run the family farm, and then when his father died, requiring him, under the terms of his father's will, to stay home and take care of his mother until he turned 21. When he came of age, however, Hannibal left home to read law at the offices of Fessenden and de Blau, or de Blau under Samuel C. Fessenden, an outspoken abolitionist and father of Hamlin's future political rival, William Pitt Fessenden. The association made Hamlin an anti-slavery man and launched him into his new profession. He set up his own law practice and became the town attorney in Hampton, Maine. Just a little bit more about his early life. Uh, Hannibal Hamlin was born to Cyrus Hamlin and his wife Anna uh, Nee Livermore 
in Paris, now in Maine, then a part of Massachusetts. He was a descendant in the sixth generation of English, English colonist James Hamlin, who had settled in Barnstable, part of the Massachusetts Bay Colony, in 1639. I'm sure I'm going to get butchered, because I know it's, I mean, it's spelled Barnstable, but I think it's Barnstable or Barnstable. Uh, Massachusetts, but I'm sure there's going to be Massachusetts people that destroy me for that. <laughs> he was a grandnephew of U.S. Senator Samuel Livermore II of New Hampshire. According to folklore, Hamlin's life was saved when he was an infant by a Native American medicine woman named Molly Ockett. Hamlin was gravely ill and Ockett prescribed that he be given warm cow's milk after which he recovered. Hamlin attended the district schools and Hebron Academy and later managed his father's farm. From 1827 to 1830, he published the Oxford Jeffersonian newspaper in partnership with Horatio King. He studied law with the firm headed by Samuel Fessenden, who was, was admitted to the bar in 1833, Hamlin was, and he began practicing in Hampton, Maine, where he lived until 1848. Now we're going to talk a little bit about democratic politics in Maine and Washington. Politically, from the 1830s to the 1850s, Maine was an entrenched democratic state, and the politically ambitious Hamlin joined the Democratic Party. In 1835, he was elected to the State House of Representatives. Described as tall and gracious in figure, with black piercing eyes, a skin almost olive-colored, hair smooth, thick and jetty, a manner always courteous and affable. He fit easily into legislative politics, became a popular member of the House, and was soon elected its Speaker. His most notable legislative achievement was to lead the movement to abolish capital punishment in Maine. In 1840, he lost a race for the U.S. House of Representatives. But in 1843, after the next election was delayed until the districts could be re uh, apportioned, he won a seat in Congress. There, he denounced Henry Clay's economic programs and voted very much as a Jacksonian Democrat. He became chairman of the Committee on Elections and won a coveted seat on the House Rules Committee. Hamlin enjoyed considerable luck in his career, particularly in February of 1844 when he missed sailing on the U.S. Navy frigate Princeton, which was going to demonstrate its new guns. One of the guns exploded, killing Secretary of State Abel Upshur and several others. <clears throat> that was actually, um, I believe that has, is it Franklin Pierce ties? That uh, U.S. Navy Princeton ship? I believe it was Franklin Pierce that met his wife on that ship. Was it Pierce or was it, it had to be Pierce. It obviously wasn't Buchanan, because he was a bachelor. I want to say it was Pierce. Anyway, there's a bell that was actually an actual bell that was on that ship, the Princeton, uh, right in Princeton, New Jersey. Uh, and during one of the um, the presidential videos that I did, uh, I showed um, that uh, right right in Princeton, New Jersey. Pretty cool stuff. And I just looked it up. Totally wrong. Not Franklin Pierce. Duh. It was John Tyler. Uh, it's the love boat bell, as they call it, from uh, President and First Lady Tyler. Uh, so pretty, pretty cool stuff. All right, moving on. The extension of slavery into the territories was the most perplexing issue to face Congress during Hamlin's long career in the House and Senate. His state of Maine had entered the Union as a result of the Missouri Compromise, which admitted one free state for every slave state. But in 1846, when the United States entered a war with Mexico, 
the prospects of vast new conquered territories south of the Missouri Compromise Line raised the question of the parameters of slavery. Hamlin joined with other radical anti-slavery men in the House to devise an amendment that would prohibit the introduction of slavery into any territory taken from Mexico as a result of the war. Pennsylvania Representative David Wilmot was selected to introduce the measure, which became known as the Wilmot Proviso. Hamlin introduced his own version of the proviso on an army appropriations bill, much to the anger of Democratic President James K. Polk. Mr. Hamlin professes to be a Democrat, the president wrote in his diary, but has given indications during the present session that he is dissatisfied and is pursuing a mischievous course on the slavery question. The president attributed Hamlin's stand to a patronage quarrel with the administration, but Hamlin stood squarely on principle. I have no doubt that the whole North will come to the position I have taken, he said. Some damn rascals who may be desirous of disposing of myself will mutter and growl about abolitionism, but I do not care the snap of my fingers for them all. Now a bit about the free soil challenge. In the house, Hamlin encountered many of the men with whom he would serve and against whom he would contend for the rest of his long career. Among others, he met representatives Abraham Lincoln of Illinois, Andrew Johnson of Tennessee, and Jefferson Davis of Mississippi. He and Davis sparred frequently in the House and Senate over slavery. Tempers between the two men rose to such a level that for the only time in his life, Hamlin thought it prudent to carry a pistol for self-protection. The unexpected death of Senator John Fairfield from malpractice by an incompetent physician opened a Senate seat from Maine which Hamlin was elected to fill in 1848. That same year, anti-slavery Whigs and Democrats united to form a free soil party that nominated Martin Van Buren for president. Although Hamlin approved of their anti-slavery platform and had supported Van Buren in the past, he could not bring himself to abandon his party, to which he owed his Senate seat. As a Democratic senator, Hamlin strongly opposed Henry Clay's proposed Compromise of 1850. If the bill spreads slavery into the West, he declared, it will not be with my vote. As a temperous man, Senator Hamlin was distressed by the drinking habits of his colleagues. He observed that New York Senator Silas Wright was never sober and even sipped whiskey while he addressed the Senate. Hamlin estimated that as many as a third of the senators were drunk by the end of a daily session, and that after a long executive session held behind closed doors, two-thirds of the members left inebriated. Nor did he approve of the ruffianly tendencies and tempers of some of senators. After a dispute between Senator Thomas Hart Benton and Henry S. Foote, in which Foote pulled a pistol on the Senate floor, Hamlin wrote in disgust to a friend, Don't you think the American Senate is a dignified body? <laughs> Pretty interesting stuff, that's for sure. Hannibal Hamlin definitely did not agree with the tomfoolery, if you will, of the uh, Senator's uh, in the Senate. Pretty interesting. Now, the Woolheads versus Wildcats. The slavery issue split the main Democratic Party into two factions. Hamlin's anti slavery faction won the name Woolheads from its opponents. The Woolheads, in turn, labeled their adversaries who opposed the Wilmot Proviso. proviso 
the Wildcats. In addition to the slavery issue, Temperance also divided the two factions with Hamlin's Woolheads supporting prohibition laws and the Wildcats opposing them. In 1854, Hamlin denounced Senator Stephen Douglas's efforts to enact the Kansas-Nebraska bill and repeal the Missouri Compromise. Shall we repeal freedom and make slavery, he asked? It comes to that. When the bill passed the Senate by a vote of 37 to 14, Hamlin was among only four Democrats to vote against it. As political turmoil reigned, Hamlin's attention was distracted by the illness of his wife, Sarah Jane Hamlin. Both Hannibal and Sarah Hamlin loved Washington's social life of dances, receptions, card playing, and theater going. The senator, she wrote home to their son, has had about 10 invitations a week to dine, and he enjoys them very much. You know how much he enjoys a good dinner. But Sarah's health declined so severely in 1855 that for a while he considered resigning his Senate seat. Sarah Jane Hamlin died from tuberculosis in April of 1856. That September, Hamlin married his wife's younger half-sister, Ellen, who was the same age as one of his sons. Characterized as plain but witty and warm-hearted, she bore two more of his children and offered him companionship through the rest of his long life. Becoming a Republican To some degree, Sarah's illness provided political cover for Hannibal Hamlin at a time when he was under intense pressure to abandon the Democrats in favor of the newly formed Republican Party. Republican leaders were anxious for the popular Hamlin to join their party to balance the radicals who threatened to gain control. We have a great many men in our party who go off half-cocked, wrote the young editor and politico James G. Blaine. They must be made to ride in the rear of the car instead of in the engine, or else we are in constant danger of being thrown from the track. In 1856, Republicans wanted Hamlin to head their ticket as the Republican candidate for governor of Maine. Hamlin clung to his old party as long as he could and also had no desire to leave the Senate. However, Republicans warned him that refusal to run for governor would end any chance of his being returned to the Senate. Hamlin agreed to run for governor but only if the legislature would send him back to the Senate as soon as possible. An effective campaigner, Hamlin canvassed the state. Republicans won a smashing victory over both Whigs and Democrats, sweeping all six congressional districts and carrying the legislature. Since Maine's elections were held in September because of the state's harsh winter weather, the early victory gave a psychological boost to the National Republican campaign that year. Hamlin won widespread credit for helping Republicans broaden their electoral base. Inaugurated governor on January 8th of 1857, Hannibal Hamlin resigned on February 25th to begin his third term as senator. In Washington, he provided the Republicans with a strong voice against the doe policies of James Buchanan's administration. It was a decidedly Maine, down-east voice, with Hamlin pronouncing now as Niao, for instance. <laughs> Niao? Niao? <laughs> I mean, how do, how, do, how do people from Maine pronounce now? <laughs> I mean, you know, Boston's like, you know, now, now, therefore, I mean, I don't understand how how the people from Maine pronounce it. Somebody help me out here. While boarding at the St. Charles Hotel in Washington, 
Hannibal Hamlin became reacquainted and favorably impressed with Andrew Johnson of Tennessee, with whom he had served in the House and who had just been elected to the Senate. As the 1860 elections approached, some Maine Republicans viewed Hamlin as a possible favorite son candidate in case the frontrunner, New York Senator William Seward, should falter. But James G. Blaine worked the Maine delegation to the Republican National Convention in favor of Abraham Lincoln's nomination. On the train ride to Chicago, Blaine convinced Governor Lot Morrill and other delegates to throw their support to Lincoln. When Lincoln upset Seward, the vice presidential nomination was offered first to the Seward camp. The disappointed Seward men put no one forward for the second spot. There was strong support among the delegates for Cassius M. Clay, the Kentucky abolitionist, but Republican Party leaders thought him too radical. By contrast, Hamlin seemed a more natural choice, more moderate, but with a spotless record against slavery and a friend of Seward's in the Senate. Hamlin won the nomination on the second ballot. The nomination came as a shock to Hannibal Hamlin. While playing cards in his Washington hotel room, Hamlin heard a racket in the corridor. The door bust open and the room filled with excited men, led by Indiana Congressman Schuyler Colfax, who read a telegram from the convention and addressed him as Mr. Vice President. Stunned, Hamlin said he did not want the office, but Ohio Senator Ben Wade warned him that to decline would only give ammunition to the Democrats, suggesting that he was afraid to run on a losing ticket. Hamlin agreed, whispering to Wade and Colfax, you people have spoiled a good lone hand I held. Afterwards, writing to his wife, Hamlin explained, I neither expected or desired it, but it has been made, and as a faithful man to the cause, it leaves me no alternative but to accept it. At least he conceded the duties of the office would not be hard or unpleasant. Whether in cards or in politics, Hamlin had a lucky streak. As Blaine observed, he always turns up on the winning side. So that obviously leads us pretty much right up to the election and his vice presidency. Uh, I'm going to read you some more stuff about personal life, political beginnings. Uh, Hannibal Hamlin married Sarah Jane Emery of Paris Hill, Maine in 1833. Her father was Stephen Emery, who was appointed as Maine's attorney general in 1839 and 1840. Hamlin and Sarah had four children together, George, Charles, Cyrus and Sarah. His wife died in 1855, and the next year Hamlin married Sarah's half-sister, Ellen Vesta Emery. They had two children together, Hannibal E. and Frank. Ellen Hamlin died in 1925. Interesting stuff there. Political beginnings, we know Hamlin's political career began in 1835, when he was elected to the Maine House of Representatives, appointed a major on the staff of Governor John Fairfield, he served with the militia in the bloodless Aroostook War of 1839. He facilitated facilitated negotiations between Fairfield and Lieutenant Governor John Harvey of New Brunswick, which helped reduce tensions and make possible the Webster-Ashburton Treaty, which ended the war. Hannibal Hamlin unsuccessfully ran for the U.S. House of Representatives in 1840 and left the State House in 1841. He later was elected to two terms in the United States House of Representatives from 1843 to 1847. He was elected by the state legislature to fill a U.S. Senate vacancy in 1848 and to a full term in 1851. A Democrat at the beginning of his career, Hamlin supported the candidacy of Franklin Pierce in 1852. From the very beginning of his service in Congress, 
Hamlin was prominent as an opponent of the extension of slavery. He was a conspicuous supporter of the Wilmot Proviso and spoke against the Compromise of 1850. In 1854, Hamlin strongly opposed the passage of the Kansas-Nebraska Act, which repealed the Missouri Compromise. After the Democratic Party endorsed, endorsed that repeal at the 1856 Democratic National Convention on June 12th of 1856, Hamlin withdrew from the Democratic Party and joined the newly organized Republican Party, causing a national sensation. The Republicans nominated Hamlin for governor of Maine the same year. He won the election by a large margin and was inaugurated on January 8th of 1857. In the latter part of February of 1857, however, he resigned the governorship. He returned to the U.S. Senate, serving from 1857 to January of 1861. And there you have it, guys. There is the early life, uh, political life, and rise all the way up to, of course, the... Uh, the vice presidency of our 15th vice president of the United States, Hannibal Hamlin. Uh, stay tuned. I'm pretty sure. Uh, I don't want to guarantee it because I'm not 100% sure yet. But uh, there should be some bonus footage here at the end of part one and also at the end of part two. So stay tuned. Uh, but I hope you enjoyed this, guys. I sure as heck did. Uh, really enjoy uh, getting back to things, of course, after a week off. Like I said, I hope everybody had a wonderful Thanksgiving. Henry and I wish you all a very happy Thanksgiving and happy holidays to everyone out there. Uh, Henry will be back with me next week. Um, you know, he was in the introduction for this one, but of course I'm doing the uh, audio solo as always. <laughs> so I uh, hope you enjoyed this part one. Thanks for everything, guys. Thanks for the support. Thank you for everything you guys do. Keep it up. Keep those comments and questions coming. And we will see you tomorrow for part two, looking at Hannibal Hamlin, our 15th vice president. See you tomorrow, guys. Thanks. Bye-bye. Hey, guys. How's it going? TJ here with Dead History. Uh, I am actually here in Paris, Maine. Uh, I'm going to... You see this behind me, this beautiful building. I'm going to turn you guys around. So, it is about 6.30 in the morning. And that building right there is actually the mansion that Hannibal Hamlin was born in. Uh, and this rock here will probably tell us that, which it does. Hannibal Hamlin, born near this spot. August 27th of 1809. Uh, so, pretty cool stuff. And there's a church there, and there's a road. And this is the beautiful mansion. As you can see, it's beautifully decorated for the holidays. Uh, birthplace of Hannibal Hamlin. So, uh, absolutely gorgeous. Uh, right over here this is a building that building right there i believe it was built in 1822 uh, and it was built as a jail uh, i'll go over there in a second but that uh, is actually the hamlin museum uh, so i'll show you guys that in a second but here you go birthplace the rock here of uh the birthplace of Hannibal Hamlin. So, there you go, guys, here in Paris, Maine. Hey, guys, TJ back with you here. I'm going to turn you guys around. There's the uh, house there, the Hamlin house. So, this is the, as I said, it was an old um, jail, and I believe it was built in 1822, and now it's the Hamlin Memorial Library Museum. Um... Obviously, it's like 6.45 in the morning, so not open right now. And I was right, 18.22. Hours of operation. 
Ooh, very nice. Get to take a uh, Hamlin brochure. If I can get one out here. Very cool. Very nice. Yeah, and it was. It was a county jail. So pretty cool. Look at that. It's kind of neat looking. And I wanted to show you guys real quick. There's the house again that he was born in, but I wanted to show you this before I get out of here. Um, take a look at this view. Like, wow. That is something. <laughs> Beautiful Maine. So, there you go, guys. Hannibal Hamlin Birthplace and Museum. Thanks. Hey guys, TJ here with Dead History, and I am actually in the Woodlawn Cemetery in Andover, Maine, I believe is it the name of it. Uh, the reason I'm here, I'm going to turn you guys around. <clears throat> this right here is actually the grave of Molly Ockett. Molly Ockett was the medicine woman, the Native American medicine woman, who supposedly at least as folklore says, saved the life of Hannibal Hamlin when he was a young child. Uh, as you see here, Molly Ockett, baptized Mary Agatha, died in the Christian faith, uh, 1816. She was the last of the Pequockets. Uh The Pequockets were a Native American group of... Um, and you'd have to look it up, but I'm pretty sure from what I read, the Pequockets were like a mix between two different Native American tribes. And she was the last of the Pequockets, Molly Ockett. And yeah, she supposedly, I uh, see some Native American stuff there. She supposedly saved his life. Uh, she was the medicine woman. I believe the uh, folklore goes... Um, warm milk. She told his parents to give him warm milk. And uh, that's what they did. Uh, and yeah, supposedly it saved his life. I don't know how true this is. Um, but that's the folklore, of course. So there used to be, I think there used to be a little sign right next to this. And no longer is here uh, from pictures I've seen uh, of this grave. But this is very cool. I'm in the middle of nowhere, in the middle of the mountains of Maine. The ride here, nothing but moose crossing signs. Very cool place. Very cool, obscure grave. I wanted to bring to you guys the grave of Molly Ockett, the Native American medicine woman who supposedly saved the life of Hannibal Hamlin. Thanks, guys. Hey guys, TJ here with Dead History. I'm actually in Hamden, Maine. I think it's Hampton, Hamden. It's H-A-M-P-D-E-N, Hampton, Maine. 
And uh, I'll tell you why I'm here. I'll show you why I'm here. Let me turn you around. I'm here for Dunkin' Donuts. No, actually, I'm here for this. <laughs> this was the site of Hannibal Hamlin's house at one point. And funny enough, it is now a Dunkin' Donuts. <laughs> this is why I love doing what I do. Because you never know. Like, you know, here it is, you know, little town. You know, and then all of a sudden it's like, oh, Hannibal Hamlin's house was here. And now you can go get your coffee and your Boston cream donut. So, pretty cool stuff. But here in Hamden, Maine, this was the site of one of the homes of Hannibal Hamlin. So, pretty cool. Thanks, guys.